book of Philippians today, chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 13. The Apostle Paul here writes, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And from that scripture, I intend to preach to you a message today which I have entitled, You Can Get Satisfaction. Amen. You Can Get Satisfaction. Let's have a word of prayer here before we get started. Jesus, we love you. We magnify you. We thank you for your goodness and your blessings. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this sermon, bless this congregation here, Lord. Open every single heart. Open every single mind. Bless my lips and anoint me, Lord, as a willing vessel to impart your word upon this congregation here, Lord. We pray, Lord, by your spirit and in your name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Let's give them one more hand clap of praise here. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, you are truly great and greatly to be praised, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And you may be seated. Now, the Apostle Paul was a man who, I think we can all agree, faced many trials during his lifetime. Just to name a few of the highlights, he was stoned, shipwrecked, chased out of the synagogues, chased out of town, lowered over the city wall in a basket, scourged, bitten by a venomous snake, a deadly snake, and those are just some of the highlights. So this is a man who really faced a lot of difficulties, faced a lot of disheartening situations in his life. And in 62 AD, he was in yet another disheartening situation because at this time he was imprisoned, awaiting trial. He was imprisoned by Roman soldiers awaiting trial in Rome. Now historians and theologians don't know the exact circumstance of Paul's imprisonment. He may have been held in a prison cell, but more than likely he was under house arrest. But even if he was just under house arrest, this was far from a pleasant situation. This wasn't something that we think of today when we think of house arrest. It wasn't a 21st century American house arrest with an ankle bracelet on and you had pretty much free run of your house. No, in Rome, when you were under house arrest, you were physically chained to your guard 24-7. So you wanted to do anything, your guard was coming with you. Imagine the weight of that iron chain, 10, 20 pounds, whatever it weighed, constantly pulling down on your arm, pulling down on your leg, hour after hour, day after day. Certainly an unpleasant situation. And there was also a, a great social stigma that associated imprisonment in Rome. Prisoners in the Roman Empire were seen pretty much as untouchable in the eyes of society. And yes, Paul received some visitors, but there were certainly many people, many so-called friends who conveniently left him behind and scorned him when he was in prison, no doubt. So this was certainly a disheartening situation for Paul, and it's easy to understand how he could be dissatisfied with his situation. In fact, in his writings at this time, he implied that his death was something that could come at any time. So this was certainly an unpleasant situation. So you could hardly blame Paul for, for being disheartened, for being dissatisfied, for being discontent. But what's interesting is if you look at the books that Paul wrote at this time, he wrote four books of the Bible, we call them the prison epistles, while he was imprisoned here. And if you look at these four books, especially this one in particular that we're going to look at today, Philippians, the theme of the book can best be summed up in one word, and that is joy. Joy. Rather than angst or displeasure or anger or woe is me or anything like that, the theme of rejoicing and joy runs throughout the entire book. In fact, those words joy or rejoicing are found in over a dozen places in the four short chapters of that book. How was it that the Apostle Paul was able, no matter these circumstances, to maintain such a positive attitude, such a joyful attitude? And we find our answer in today's scriptural passage where Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. You see, Paul wasn't drawing his satisfaction from his circumstances. He wasn't drawing his satisfaction from the things of the world. He was drawing his satisfaction from Christ and from Christ alone. And he used these two extremes here, abasement and abounding, to, to really drive his point home. And these are really the two extremes of the human experience, if you think about it. Abounding being the top of the highest mountain, abasement really being the lowest low, the bottom of that lowest valley. And we're all at somewhere in that spectrum at some point in our lives. We're all everywhere in that spectrum. And they each present their own unique challenges. 
both being abased and abounding, present their own challenges. Wherever we lie on that spectrum, if we seek our joy, if we seek our satisfaction, if we seek our contentment from the things of this world or from our circumstances, we're never going to be truly satisfied. It's all too easy when we're struggling, when we're going through a difficult situation, a difficult circumstance, to feel overwhelmed, to feel helpless, discouraged, dissatisfied with our lot in life. It's really easy to look at what we don't have and then start looking at what our neighbors have, what our friends have, what our relatives have, and start cleaving after that, start coveting that. And it's all too easy to try to draw our satisfaction or numb our pain, depending on how you want to put it, through the things of this world. And this is something that I know firsthand. Before I came to God, and I've talked about this a little bit before, I was struggling greatly. I was depressed. I was struggling with anxiety. And I was trying all the solutions the world had to offer, the drugs, the drink. And you know what? They felt good for a second. I'm not going to lie to you. Most sin does, if we're being honest. Otherwise, people probably wouldn't sin. But as soon as that high wore off, as soon as that temporary fix came down, I felt worse than before. I felt emptier than before. And this doesn't just go for drugs or alcohol or anything. This can be anything that the world has to offer. Because so many in the world use this to try to fill something. Because we all have this God-shaped hole in our heart. We all have this desire in our spirit to commune with God. And if you try to fill that with a world-shaped peg, it's not going to fit, no matter how you try to cram it in there. You can turn it, you can twist it, you can shove it in. It might patch it for a minute. It's not going to fit in that hole, though. And this problem isn't limited to those who are abased. I would say that those who abound so often are no more satisfied than those who are abased. A lot of us know that famous quote that we've heard attributed, at least I've heard attributed, to probably half a dozen different rich men where they're asked, how much money is enough? And they always say, just a little bit more. I've heard Rockefeller said it, Onassis said it, but I think they all probably said it, honestly. Because if you're seeking your satisfaction from your abundance, then when is enough truly ever enough? When do you finally hit that, that magical marker where you finally made it? What is it, a million dollars? And say it is a million dollars. What's so dissatisfying then about $999,999.99? What's so special about that one penny that finally pushes you over the threshold? And the answer, of course, is nothing. There's nothing special about that one penny. It's no different than the first penny you earned. And that million dollars isn't going to satisfy you for long. It may keep you occupied for a little while until you see something you need for $1.1 million. And then all of a sudden you're going to be moving that goal line. That goal line of satisfaction is constantly shifting. And this can be true of anything. It's not just money. It can be true of anything. Drugs, sex, possessions, food, whatever else we use to satisfy ourselves. In our humanity, we're never really at that point where enough is enough. And that's a part of our flesh. We see this in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, who had quite literally the world at their fingertips. They had dominion over all the animals. They had access to all the trees except for one, just one. Everything in the world that they knew, except one thing that they didn't have, but yet that wasn't enough. That was not enough. And this temptation of allowing our satisfaction to be found in our circumstances doesn't just apply to those who are in the world. It doesn't just apply to, to those who don't know God. Even the people of God are not exempt from this danger. They're not exempt from these perils. There have been many people who have allowed either their abounding or their abasement to drastically affect their walk of God or even pull them away from God. It's very easy when we're going through something to blame God. Say, why me? Why do I deserve to go through this? And there's some people who have allowed that to pull them away from God permanently. Those who abound in the things of this world who are living for God, if they're not careful can very easily find themselves serving those things instead of God. There's nothing wrong with money in and of itself. Money in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Doing well for yourself is not a bad thing. But when that money becomes what you are serving, what you love instead of God, now we've got a problem. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now I'd note here that 
Paul is talking about people who were in the faith. He's not talking about people of the world because he says, for which some have strayed from the faith. In order to stray from the faith, you have to be in the faith to begin with. So he's not talking about people who never knew God. He's talking about people who loved God, who were faithful people, who allowed the money to draw themselves away from God. And we see this with the rich young ruler as well and his encounter with Jesus. He asked Jesus in Mark chapter 10, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So right from the get-go, he knows the stakes. He knows he's talking about salvation. He knows he's talking about eternity here. And Jesus reminds him of the commandments to which the rich young ruler replies, all these things I have kept from my youth. This is someone who had served God from his youth the best he knew how, by following the Mosaic law, by following the commandments. He thought he was doing pretty good. But then Jesus said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But the rich young ruler couldn't do that. Instead, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He knew his eternal fate was on the line. He knew his salvation was on the line. Yet he couldn't separate himself from his wealth for the sake of his salvation. And we can fill this blank in with anything. Again, it's not just money. It's whatever it is of this world that can draw us away from God. It's whatever we end up serving that isn't God. So we've talked a lot about what we shouldn't find our satisfaction in, but let's talk about what's more important, and that's what we should find our satisfaction in. And this is something that Paul reveals in verse 13. He reveals the base upon which he builds his relationship with with God and his satisfaction. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this is a verse I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with. Now, Paul isn't talking about supernatural feats here. He's not talking about being imbued with strength to rip the chains off of his arms and punch a hole in the wall and run through the streets of Rome to find his freedom. That's not what Paul's talking about. Now, certainly God could work the miraculous. We see miracles happen all the time. So I don't mean to say that God's not able to do that. But sometimes that miracle's not going to come. But whatever our situation, whether that miracle comes or not, we can handle any situation, any circumstance, if we draw our strength and our peace from Christ and from Christ alone. Now, make no mistake about it, this isn't an overnight process. It's not an easy process. There's a reason that Paul says he has learned to be content. He doesn't say, I woke up one morning and found myself content. He doesn't say that the minute he was born again, he all of a sudden found himself content. It's a process. Learning is a process, and it's one that takes effort. The basketball player doesn't roll out of bed one morning having never touched a basketball before and all of a sudden can hit a shot from half court. That's not how it works. He puts in the time. He puts in the effort to get himself to that place. And we've got to put in the time and the effort ourselves to get ourselves to that place in Jesus. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there is nothing more worth it. There is nothing more worth getting to that point in Christ where we can finally lean on him and draw our satisfaction from him and from him alone. So how do we learn to be content, as Paul says? Well, there's a couple things we we need to do. First, we need to seek God through prayer. We need to seek God through prayer. Now, we talk about prayer a lot, and there's a good reason for that. You cannot overstate the importance of prayer. It is the lifeblood of our relationship with Jesus. Prayers mentioned in the Bible, depending on your translation, about 600 times throughout the Old and New Testaments. It is one of, if not the biggest foundational blocks of our relationship with God. And like so many other things in life, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And I don't mean whether you're going to get your prayer answered or not. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the depth of your relationship with God. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 12 to 13 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. With all your heart. We've got to ensure that our relationship with Jesus is built on deep prayer, effectual prayer, fervent prayer, prayer that really stems from the depths of our inward being. And it takes time and effort to get to this place with our prayer life. It absolutely does. I'm just going to be honest. If the only time we can find for God is a couple minutes while we're sitting at the stoplight or 30 seconds as we rest our heads on our pillow when we go to bed, 
it's going to be very difficult to build a deep relationship with God. I don't say this out of condemnation. I say this out of experience. We've got to put time aside for God first. Because if we don't do that, we live in a world with so many distractions. We put work here. We put family here. We put this club here, this activity here, this sport here. And then we've got the entire day full. Where does God fit in there? We talk a lot about the first fruits of our increase going to God, and it absolutely needs to. But I think we need to talk more about the first fruits of our time going to God. Because time is a resource that's even more scarce than money. Nobody ever has enough of it. And you're never getting it back. So we've got to make sure we put time away for God first. And again, I say this out of experience, not out of condemnation. Because when I first came to God, I'd never had any experience with a prayer life. I had very little experience praying at all. I might, you know, breathe a five-second prayer here or there, but that was about it, or recite something that I had heard somewhere. That was all I knew. And it took a lot of time and effort to get myself to that place where I could really consecrate time for God, set time aside for God. I remember the first time I tried to pray for 15 minutes straight. It did. Do it. going to be pastors talk about this before. There's going to be times where you're just not feeling it. You just got to press through. You've got to fight through it. You've got to continue to seek God in prayer. Because that's where the depth of your relationship with God is going to come from. It's through that prayer life. It's through that prayer that we can finally reach a place where God grants us the peace and the strength that we need to get through anything. Earlier on in chapter 4 of Philippians, this is verses 6 through 7, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice that Paul doesn't say anything here about whether this prayer is answered or not. That's not mentioned in the scripture at all. Now, certainly, we're very blessed to serve a God who, who does answer prayers very often. But sometimes we're not going to get that answer we're looking for. Sometimes we're not going to get any answer at all. If our contentment to God is tied through whether or not our prayer is answered, then we're not getting our contentment from God. We're really getting our contentment from our circumstances. When we get what we want, we're satisfied. But Paul does say here that through prayer, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Whether our prayers are answered or not, and God certainly hears them, and his ways are far above ours, whether our prayers are answered or not, when we seek God in prayer, we can draw off this peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, and our hearts and minds will be guarded through Jesus and Jesus alone. As we continue to seek God, we'll find that we get to know him better. As we get to know him better, it becomes easier to trust in him, which is another important part of being able to find that peace in God is trusting in him. We talk a lot about trusting in God, but again, it's one of those things where sometimes it's easier said than done. It doesn't come overnight. It doesn't just happen instantly. At least not for me it didn't. I'm just being honest. Maybe, maybe I'm an outlier, but it takes work to get there. And it takes time. And the better we know him, the easier it becomes to trust him. I mean, if I was walking down the street and a stranger walked up to me and said, hey, can I see your wallet? Assuming that I wasn't getting mugged, which that would be my first thought, then I'd give him the wallet. But assuming I could rule that out, I'd say, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't know you. I'm not going to give you my wallet. Okay. But if the first lady said, hey, can I see your wallet? I'd say, sure, here you go. Because I know her. I trust her. I have that relationship with her where it's easy for me to trust her. And the better we get to know Jesus, the better we get to know him through prayer, the more we get to know his character through reading his word, the more we get to really understand his mercy, his grace, his love, his sacrificial nature, then it becomes so much easier to trust in him. We can trust in his promises. We can trust in his peace. We can trust that he's not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. No temptations overtake you, such as content of man. That includes the temptation to look to our circumstances and look to our situation for our satisfaction. 
that is a temptation as well. And sometimes it's very tempting. And you better believe that the devil, that great tempter, loves nothing more than when he sees the people of God trusting in themselves and trusting in their circumstances instead of trusting in God. Because then he sees an opening. He sees a bullseye there. But if we draw our satisfaction from Christ and from Christ alone, there is not a thing in the world that the devil can do to lay a hand on us. He can shoot those fiery darts of temptation which he loves to use as his primary weapon as much as he wants. But if we hold up that shield of faith, they're all going to bounce harmlessly off onto the ground. We can also trust that no matter how bad our situation looks in the moment, and sometimes it looks pretty bad. Sometimes our circumstances can look pretty bad. The Apostle Paul's circumstances look pretty bad. I mean, he was talking about his death being imminent. It's tough to get much worse than that. But whatever we're dealing with in the flesh, no matter how bad it is, it is only temporary. And a far greater glory awaits us. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. They're not even in the same order of magnitude. They're not even, you can't even put them in the same sentence. They're not worthy to be compared with one another because that glory that awaits us in heaven is so far beyond anything that we can experience here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18 say, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light of which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I know it doesn't always feel like it in the moment. Trust me, I've been there. I'm, I'm there often, honestly. <laughs> but it is temporary. Anything we're facing in the flesh is temporary. Anything we face during our walk on this planet is temporary. There's something far greater waiting at the end for us. Life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Right. And we've got to keep our eyes on the prize of the finish line. Sometimes it feels like that finish line is 25 miles down the road. And we can barely make it out. But you know what? If you squint hard enough, you can see it just a little bit down there. And that little bit is that boost that we need to get through, because that's Jesus waiting down there for us. That's heaven waiting down there for us. That's eternal glory waiting down there for us. But we can rest easy in knowing that Jesus can sympathize with our struggles. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand. Now, in the ancient world, there was not a more excruciating way to be killed than crucifixion. It was the most painful method of death possible. You literally suffocate under your own weight. It was gruesome. It was reserved for the worst criminals. And it was scornful and, and shameful. They were hung up there to, to really as a form of embarrassment. Yet Jesus was willing to suffer this ultimate humiliation, this ultimate scorn, this ultimate pain for the joy that was set before him. For that joy of giving us a way that we may be saved. For that joy of giving us a way that our sins could be paid for, that our iniquities could be washed away, that the price of our sins could be paid, and that we could enjoy eternal glory with him. And aren't you glad that we serve a God who loves us that much, who loves us that much, that he would be willing to give his own life, to hang on a cross, to suffer the scorn, the humiliation, to make a way for you and you, and you, and every single one of us. We're so fortunate to serve God who loves us that much. So if we rest easy on these promises of God, if we seek God, if we trust in God, if we look to Him, if we build that relationship with Him, then we're going to find ourselves more able to rest on that peace, to draw off of that peace that only He offers. And He is the, the only source of satisfaction that will truly satisfy us regardless of circumstance. In 1965, the Rolling Stones, and I'm sure many of you have heard of, released a song titled, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And that's where I got the title from, because that's how it's formatted. 
Now, in case you couldn't guess this from the title, the theme of the song is the fact that the singer, who's Mick Jagger, couldn't get any satisfaction. He couldn't find satisfaction in sex. He couldn't find satisfaction in the commercialism of the world. And this is probably the only time you're ever going to hear me say this. But I would say that I agree with Mick Jagger on this one. Because if that's where you're looking for your satisfaction, you're never going to find it. You're never going to find it. But you know what? You can find satisfaction. I can find satisfaction. Even Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones can find satisfaction if they only knew where to look for it. Because if we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as our only source of strength, as that rock that we rest on and we draw our satisfaction from, then we will be able to withstand any storm, any tempest, whether it's calm seas or stormy, we'll be able to make it through and make it through strong.